Provider organizations are struggling financially and strategically in the post-pandemic world. They want to differentiate on the patient experience, but most use the same Epic patient portal software. They're experimenting with alternative payment models, but not dramatically altering the caregiving approach. And they're embracing AI without really figuring out where it's taking them. Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare leaders about their lives and careers. My guest today is Dr. Awesom Saeed, CEO and founder of Amenities Health, a digital front door that embraces lessons learned from the likes of Amazon and Costco. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review. Awesome, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, David. You know, we started out, I want to make sure to pronounce your name right. You told me like awesome, but I said, just call you awesome to start with, because that's, you know, I look at your background and that's that's pretty much what it says. So even if your parents hadn't named you that, we'd have to call you that right here. Oh, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> so let's talk about your uh, your background, your upbringing. Any any childhood influences that have uh, that have stuck with you through uh, through your career? Yeah, I think two things. So one, I come from a family of physicians, and uh, to some degree, I disappoint them every day by not practicing medicine. So I I went to med school. My my parents were uh, my earliest memories was were them in med school. Um, so I think that was obviously uh, an influence that we'll talk about at length. Um, and then I think the other one is probably just kind of the, the immigrant story and mentality. I mean, I grew up as a South Asian uh, immigrant in very rural Texas. And I don't know, maybe uh, that started this kind of empathetic uh, journey, which is to say, I'm always wondering what it's like for the other. So even though I'm a physician, I, I find myself more inclined to say like, what does it feel like for a patient and trying to navigate that? So I'm, I'm far less forgiving of the physician experience than you'd think I might be. And maybe that's rooted in that origin. Yeah, it's not a political show, but I am an advocate for immigration and a kind of you know, high percentage of the people that I have on the show and those that have actually you know made a difference of the American economy and healthcare and, and elsewhere have an immigrant uh, story uh, to tell. And, uh, we're much the poorer in many ways, uh, for clamping down on that. So I'll just, I'll just say that, uh, let's talk about your education. Normally I start with, you know, college and, and, and so on. And, and I could with you because you go on and on with all, all the, you know, I think you hit all the Harvard professional schools, at least maybe not the, uh, the divinity school, but, um, but start at high school. I saw on your LinkedIn profile, it seems like, you know, while you were at high school, there was a tragedy that occurred as well. And it helped shape some of your experience. Yeah, if you're referencing the the shooting at, at Santa Fe, so that came much later. I was I'm, that was uh, a couple of years ago, um, but yeah, I'm very much from Santa Fe, Texas, uh, to that point about rural Texas, and it's really a huge part of my identity now too. Just to be very clear, like I'm very Texan. When people sometimes hear me or see me from, or see my picture, but then meet me and they're like, "Why do you sound like this?" I'm like, "Oh, I've, I've grown <laughs> up in from? Texas all my life." Yeah, like where are you from? Yeah. Exactly that question. I was like. Oh, I'm, I'm far more of a kind of a hillbilly than anything else these days. But yeah. um, but it's it's wonderful. I mean, I, I loved every moment of growing up there. I also, you know, it was I had a very privileged experience, too, that I grew up playing high school football in Texas. And that's kind of a fast pass to a good time other than, you know, maybe a traditional immigrant experience there. Um, but I loved it. But it's also tragic because. Yeah, my, my political views don't always align to the to the dynamics that uh, Santa Fe was going through during that tragedy. Um, I wrote an op-ed about it uh, to the Austin Statement about just trying to find some middle ground on a lot of these things. And again, I know that's not the purpose of the show today, but um, it's 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 something that I, I do think is formative in terms of, like you said, having empathy, just knowing that like you can't just account for people that see the world like you do. I, I feel like so many of our problems are built and assessed in silo and that that's not going to work. Uh, there are these kind of um, multi coalitions that need to be built to solve anything really big or challenging. And growing, growing up in Santa Fe is, uh, I think, a root of a lot of that experience. And the tragedy was no different. And the op-ed is just me trying to come up with something that might be more palatable middle ground, not what my ideal would be answer. It's far from that, in fact but rather to say, what's a more pragmatic one? How could something work? And even then, by the way, I had people shoot that down, be like, never gonna happen. Oh, I wouldn't accept yeah. that for a heartbeat. 
that's fine too. I'm trying. Like that's all I would say is like, I'm just trying to come up with something that I think would be more palatable. So yeah. Great. So anyway, so after Santa Fe, you were at Rice and Duke and then up into my neck of the woods, the various Harvard uh, schools. What was, what was your educational journey like? Yeah. So um, I found myself kind of drifting a bit early. So even though I was a pre-med uh, student at Rice, because I kind of figured I was going to do that a little bit later, um, I took the opportunity to major in something different. So one semester I took art, Spanish, sociology, political science, and organic chemistry. I was still doing some pre-meds and ended up just loving political science. Uh, I majored in political science. I had I, to this day, 20 years now, volunteer with the American Legion Texas Boys State Program. I ended up in med school pursuing a joint degree at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. So it started to permeate, even though I thought it was just kind of this like fun thing that would be my frivolous, not frivolous, but like, you know, fun aside before the seriousness of, of medical school. It ended up permeating. I, I recently got a chance, uh, very privileged to to participate in the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, which is put on by the presidential libraries. And and this is just a thread, right? Like that kind of permeates through. And so I would say even going far as back as the Texas Boys State Program that I participated in, again, as a high school senior in Texas, um, the program has two central themes, which is learn by doing um, and servant leadership. And I, I think that that's kind of my philosophy that ended up tracking all those things. Now, that being said, I as you mentioned at the very beginning, at the Kennedy School, one of the coolest things was you could really cross-register. So I spent some time at the business school. I spent some time. I took negotiations at the law school instead of the other one, which was very fun and interesting. School of Public Health, even the Fletcher School at Tufts for International Law and Diplomacy. So I'm, I'm a very distractible person. So a yeah. lot of interest. And so I took it full on advantage of those things. Now, how did you like McKinsey? So McKinsey was a, a really a, a formative training ground, I think, for me. Um, I didn't I don't think I knew exactly what I was getting into other than I was like, oh, this would be a great internship experience. And obviously there's a lot of prestige around it. Um, but then I didn't track for when I took the summer internship that I actually preferred it uh, to clinical practice. So for me, like McKinsey, the first uh, week of the summer internship, um, which was before I graduated and decided if I was going to go into clinical medicine or not. Um, you're sitting at the board meeting of the healthcare system talking about which kind of portfolio, how to right size those things. And kind of from that moment, I fell in love and said, well, this is what I want to be doing longer term. Why am I going to go through residency just to try to get back here when this seems to be a fast track? Um, that was the reasoning to go to McKinsey instead of the clinical route. But I'll, I'll also be remiss to say, like, I don't think I realized then the skills are so differentiated. So often I, I find myself... I have other friends and colleagues who were also in med school and went on to clinical routes. And one of my good friends ended up being a CEO of a hospital. And I remember asking him, like, how do you feel trained to do that? Like, you have no competence. I mean, being a doctor does not train you. Like, what's a P&L? What's a balance sheet? How do these statements work? Like, you have no training any of that. And I, I just find that, like, it's so odd to me sometimes when we go these clinical routes and they're like, well, we'll just assume they'll be great leaders this. Not that, of course, physicians can't be great leaders, but like I very much look at McKinsey as my residency in the business of U.S. healthcare, And it very much was that. I mean, you get some other things like the, quote, consulting toolkit about being able to ha handle large data sets, uh, financial models, being able to build out business cases that consider a lot of different strategic options. Those things are all great. Um, but at the same time, it was just grounded in a lot of different skill set than I would have otherwise gotten in residency. So very happy with it. But at the same time, it was also, it's a great place to be from. Like, I think McKinsey is very anchored in the, like, what's going to make money now? I mean, it, they make claim, and it, I'm sure there's a, a PowerPoint somewhere that talks about the innovation at McKinsey. But I, I think at the end of the day, it is about, like, feasibility, current business models, large dollar ones as opposed to like the big risky environments of, you know, true innovation of disruptive, like unicorns that come out in Silicon Valley and other things. That's not to say that, again, there's been wildly successful former McKinsey startup entrepreneurs. And, you know, I hope to be one one day, but it's it felt very different in that sense. Like that risk tolerance was very different there. Yeah. And you wouldn't stay in your residency forever. And, uh, you know, as a physician, so. We wouldn't expect you to stay at McKinsey for 30 years or so until they put you out to pasture. Yeah. Uh, when I was at Boston Consulting Group, you know, we had 
uh, some people had it trained as a physician and they said, actually, the key to being a consultant is sort of hung up their stethoscope. You couldn't think exactly like a physician in order to be a, to be a consultant. And I think you're right about looking at those that have these big business roles. And they, sometimes I think physicians figure, well, I went to med school, I've done all this stuff, you know, I, of course I can do all these other things. And uh, some of them can, and, and, but not all, and there's some blind sides to it as well. Yeah. I, and I mean, if I'm being blunt, it's just very different skill sets. I mean, I think there's clinical professions that are very much about knowledge base, memorization of large data sets, which again, we know in the future is a big question onto itself. Yeah. And then there's other ones that are highly mechanical about doing the same thing every day, orthopedic surgery, et cetera, and fine tuning uh, things. Those are not at all the same thing of like the analytical uh, mindset of consulting and business um, evaluation. So yeah, yeah, anybody who overlooks that and just assumes that is does not make the right call. So so what's what was Livewire? So Livewire was my first foray into um, startup life. So I left McKinsey partly because uh, my biggest deficit of it was you know our biggest product was PowerPoint solutions. Yeah. I started to do a lot more technology stuff towards the end of my tenure at McKinsey. But at the same time, um, that little bit of exposure got me super excited about products. And I didn't know this at the time, but I ended up playing the chief product officer role in an early stage startup and just fell in love with products. So Livewire was a financial marketplace for tax, accounting and financial advisors. Even today, it's, it's kind of miserable or difficult to find a new tax or accountant or financial yeah. advisor. I mean... The, the majority of people you talk to them, they're like, I don't know, my dad has a guy is like still yeah. the answer in 2023. There's a lot of challenges to why that marketplace doesn't exist. Two side marketplaces are kind of notoriously difficult. Um, but I got to learn all about it as I launched an early stage tax accounting uh, startup and it was acquired early stage by H&R Block. It was never huge, but it was a great learning ground. And, and frankly, when I got to really flex and fall in love with product, which is kind of more how I fancy myself now. And then more so even than a clinical background, I have, you know, I can build a clinical model for diabetes or something without having to go hire a doc to consult for it. But it's the product mindset that I, I think I leverage more regularly. Um, and then the other thing that was really surprising and fun about Livewire was, so my next move was back into healthcare, how much of the two-sided marketplace um, concepts and struggles and problems applied directly, like one for one uh, back in healthcare. And so I got to lean on that pretty heavy and frankly, had spent more time thinking about it than I think anybody else in the country at that time. And was it was that Baylor Scott and White, your next move? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I was very excited to get back into healthcare after that acquisition. Um, obviously, my background was going to be in healthcare and, and fintech was a bit of a, a deviation to start with. But again, great training ground for product and being out of my element there. But Baylor Scott and White uh, in 2017 was, uh, they had already created, but just very recently, what they called the digital health office. And I think that's all the rage these days with yeah. different innovation digital teams. Um, we ended up growing to be, I want to say the third largest one in the country behind UPMC and Providence. So at my departure two years ago now, I managed a team of about 150 FTEs and $40 million annual budget. So we were a pretty sizable one and we'd grown into quite a sophisticated product shop, but it was also just a delightful fit in the sense that like it was back in Texas. I I'm here in Dallas. That's where I live today, yeah. which is the headquarters of Baylor Scott and White. It's a great culture. They were very open to the idea of a physician product technical person. So I, I kind of fit the environment. As I mentioned, I've I love Texas. Grew up in Texas, wanted to stay. And I think that was part of the good fit as well. And so it was, it was a wonderful experience. So let's talk now about amenities health. And the first question I have is, you know, what need did you see? You know, why, why bother start up uh, something totally new? Yeah. So one of the things that we did at Baylor, and they're, they're very much related, but then I'll try to call out where that departs from the experience at Baylor. Um, but it was often like innovation was this this wide open thing, like, what should we do? And often, especially in 2017, it was like a lot of pet projects. I mean, I literally said we were like vacuum salesmen door to door. Yeah. We were like, would you like some innovation, Dr. So-and-so? Or would you like to try this dermatology app? And it was all a waste. I mean, just to be very blunt, like these little marginal uh, frivolous things, like let's create a wall chart and refigure how people look at the screen of the EMR together in the room or just kind of like very minor use cases that were never going to change the big picture. I was a bit obsessed with what about the basics, like the fundamental things that every patient hates about healthcare. I can't figure out what doctors you have 
I can't see when they're available and I can't book that appointment by myself. So those are the things that we ended up very much focusing on. And we had a wide range of innovation still. We had robotic process automation, all these other things we were responsible for. But once we started fixing those things, those things worked and they worked so well. And some of that was technology. It was designing a better product. It was integrating directly into Epic for scheduling and things like that. But some of it was also just operational calls the leadership made. Like um, we didn't have a big conversation about opening schedules for primary care. We just they just did that. And that wasn't us. That wasn't a digital team. That was an operational call that we very much appreciated because there's a lot of health systems we talked to today that say, hey, we want to build a, a new app. We have just greenlit this major initiative. It's going to be amazing. Can you help us do that? And my first question back is, great. Do you have open schedules for primary care? And they said, no, we're working on that. I'm like, great. Would you download the Pizza Hut app if you couldn't order a pizza in it? Why would anybody want your garbage app? Like, I'm very blunt about this. Like, you got to have the thing that pay people want. And if you're a big health system, they want the appointment with a doctor. And so if you don't fix that first thing. So that's what we did with my BSW Health, which was a $25 million investment, a massive kind of say, hey, we get we, we can't just stay on my chart. We got to build something better, bigger, badder. And it's going to be the front door of a lot of things. And that that investment paid off in space, even though that's hefty and the vast majority of health systems can't make that type of investment easily these days, um, it paid off 10x, literally. We added half a million net new patients through that tool and through that website. And yet, you know, we still see a lot of health systems with un having we some weird Rorschach test version of what is a digital front door. And we're like, it's a consumer grade website and mobile experience branded to you that gets you the patient and gets them what they want, which is a doctor's appointment. And yet we have all these like chatbots as the answer to that question yeah. somehow. And it's just crazy to me. So anyway, amenities was two things. It was one to say health systems shouldn't have to build this over and over again themselves. That's just incredibly wasteful. So we do that. We are best in class. If you love my BSW Health, which a lot of people do, it's that again for others. Um, and then the second thing is it, it goes beyond that because the other thing that really I felt was missing and the reason I left Baylor Scott and White to go do this as an independent company was, okay, getting better registration into the app, getting better provider search, getting to be able to book an appointment. That's great. But just to be clear, like that's getting the suck out of healthcare. Like that's, we haven't made a massive world changing difference. Yeah. And what I really wanted to build next and why the name amenities also was, I, I feel like there's ways to fix a lot of the experience problems in healthcare, if we just had a business reason to, because today we fundamentally believe that health systems and most providers don't compete on experience. And that was one big thing. We're like, well, why don't they? It's insane. If you look at the lifetime value of a patient in US healthcare, it is at minimum half a million dollars to a million five on average, which is crazy. But nobody thinks of it that way. If that that's higher than a lifetime value of anything I can think of besides like private helicopter and yacht sales. Yeah, right. And yet health systems like feel like they're going out of their way to piss you off, right? It'd be like, oh, yeah. we're only open till four, not till five. Ah, you can't register for the app. You got to call these nine numbers. They should be rolling out the red carpet. And that's the concept of amenities is like, let's give them something to be loyal to. So, so let's rewind a little bit, even to your first point regarding the scheduling and open scheduling, because that's yeah. been something that's been not a technology problem, but more of a, of a cultural and a process and a policy problem for at least, you know, 20 years. Now, are we at the stage where, and I think the idea is people, you know, they don't want to reveal their schedule. They don't want to give up control over it. Are we at the point where people actually can like pick a time or is it just kind of like, cause where I've seen it in Boston anyway, is usually more of a scheduled request, you know, are, no, are, are Wednesdays we, better, you know? So open scheduling sounds like a simple thing, but, and, and this is not our choice, but a lot of EMRs have, made it far more complex. Yeah. So there is open scheduling, meaning anyone can schedule. There's direct scheduling, there's service scheduling, there's request what you've said there. And there's like five other ones. And the reality is we try to simplify that world exactly to your point. So absolutely, it needs to be getting an appointment, not requesting one. But the second thing I would say is it shouldn't be more technically complicated than scheduling a haircut, which is yeah. to say, you need to know the provider, the date and time and the, the length of that appointment and the location, right? And we've made it way more complicated. And to your point, it's it's often it's often a negotiation with the providers who are like, well, I only want to see 
you know, I, I want to see sports physicals on Tuesday mornings. That's how I like to work. Yeah. Too bad is my kind of answer. Like that's not consumer centric. Like that's yeah. position centric. And so that's where I said, like, I, I would say it is mostly operational. There is a technological component, which is two big things. One is the provider directory. I mean, we find that health yeah. systems, again, really struggle with the basics of like who, which doctors work there and where do they work and what is their phone number kind of thing. And then second is the open scheduling, I think, is about integration into the EMR. So, you know, there's a, a dozen tools if you're, again, a barbershop or something and you want to push that stuff online. Shopify, scheduling, there's all these tools that make it really easy to publish. We all know that's not the EMR, right? Like you can't just be like, oh, let's just publish and we'll give you APIs for all this. You have to go kicking and screaming, going and get these APIs. You have to custom build them or other things. But the reality is like, you have to. That's that's what matters most. If you don't have an app that is anchored in physician scheduling, you're just doing stuff on the margin. Got it. So, you know, you're starting to talk about this, uh, you know, lifetime value of a customer. And, and as you said, right, a lot of times for a consumer good, it could be a lifetime value. It could be a thousand or five thousand dollars. You're talking up into six and even seven figures for just the average person walking through the door. And by the way, a lot of it paid by the government. So it's like they can they can afford it over time, even if the country as a whole can't. Yeah. The organizations that that look at their customers that way, you know, they behave in other ways, like membership model is a common one. I've been an Amazon Prime member uh, forever. And I know there's some discussion about membership models in healthcare and some use of it. Does it make sense to have that membership model in, in healthcare? And, you know, what, if anything, makes it different from a consumer model like an Amazon membership? Yeah, fantastic question and enthusiastic, yes. In fact, I not only believe that, I'm clearly betting my whole career on it. So the premise of amenities is very much memberships might get us to care about uh, the experience in healthcare. So I think there's a lot of things that we can't necessarily, I don't have a good answer of how we fix. Like, I don't know how we fix cost because yeah. everyone kind of benefits. They don't, not, they don't say that openly, but they all kind of benefit, even insurance companies. Oh, we have a medical loss ratio. Well, 15% of an ever growing number is an ever growing number kind of thing, right? But experience, if we started competing on it, I think memberships is the way that the world has kind of accepted because it solves a lot. It checks a lot of boxes, right? It's recurring revenue. It's a financial commitment. And unlike a lot of other things that we've attempted before, it will, I believe it will steer people more than they, than anything else has. Because I think we've, we've tried so many different things for steerage, right? We've said, oh, we'll buy at physician groups. That'll steer them in network. Oh, we'll start narrowing the network. We'll start building ACOs. Patients don't recognize any of this stuff. You have to kind of make the thing that needs to happen the easier, better thing to happen. And I think memberships are the way to do that because nobody makes you shop only for Amazon. But how often do you go to another website? And even when you do, do you go back and check to see if it's also on Amazon to get yeah. it there? Right. Like we all do. And that's by the way, that's the inspiration for this. It's not like I have some other wild membership experience. 175 million Americans are Amazon Prime members. And I always say like they figured out two things that changed the dynamic because I used to be an Amazon uh, or used to shop occasionally on Amazon, but mostly still at Walmart. And the minute that shifted was free returns and two day shipping, right? Because they solved the fundamental challenges of e-commerce, which made it better than regular retail. And once it did that, now I step foot in a Walmart like twice a year, only when yeah. I have to have something now. Um, because I'd rather have the reviews, I'd rather have the two-day shipping, I'd rather unlimited returns. Why go anywhere else? I know they're not going to hassle me for why did you return this or did you open it kind of stuff. In fact, they kind of bend over backwards to give you a good experience because they know the lifetime value. They play that long game. And so amenities, our membership approach is to say, not only should we do memberships, but we need to figure out what memberships are the two-day shipping and the free returns, not just any memberships. Because I would argue... One Medical is a great example. I'm like, great. No one is, I mean, everyone who's a One Medical me member is like, oh my God, did you know I can get a pay an appointment tomorrow? Like the bar is very low with what yeah. they're thrilled about. It's not like that was the best doctor I've ever encountered or they solved my, you yeah. know, this rash that no one else could find. It was just like they had an appointment tomorrow and their yeah. pillows were nice in the waiting room kind of thing, right? And so I think for the memberships in our research, we just ask people, what would you like? And we test a bunch of concepts. Now, this is back to that, like people would ask for a faster horse to the Model T. People aren't going to exactly know, but we have some indicators that tell us it's not about the care. It's about 
the peace of mind. So for example, for us, all of the, the top features that come back in these surveys that we're running and the research that we're driving are financial in nature. And it makes sense because we, we also ask them, what's the biggest problem in healthcare? The majority say cost, the worry of bankruptcy, the worry of financial ruin. And so not surprisingly, we have a feature we've tested called no surprise billing guarantee. And that's the number one membership feature people are asking for, not anything that the market has given us to date. Got it. So, you know, there's been, I want to shift to moving to uh, artificial intelligence because there's been a lot of talk about that in 2023 and some action. And I'm wondering if, if you look at AI, where do you see the opportunity in 2024 and beyond for amenities or for, you know, this overall concept that you've been talking about? So I'm probably the most pessimistic about this. I don't think we're going to make much progress at all in the next two years. And that's because I not only seen this story before, I lived this story before. Ten years ago, it was IBM Watson. AI is going to change everything. Five years ago, there was a, a big market for predictive sepsis risk scores, right? Yeah. Bayesian health. I personally did that analysis and tried to bring those in. And without getting into the, the rougher parts of it, like there's a reason that market doesn't exist today. And it's because yeah. of incumbency and other challenges. We've been down this road before. I think sepsis was an unbelievably good use case and we didn't get our act together. And now what I see us doing is we're not even starting with the use case. We're just like, can you see what ChatGPT can do? It's amazing. Yeah. Let's throw it at shit. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like, what's the use case? I, you're not going to be surprised to hear this. The place where we're exploring it is so mundane. It's scheduling. It's, mm -hmm. it's because we're trying to figure out, like, could this enable specialists to open their schedules more? Because that's a whole different thing than primary yeah. care, right? So we're not trying to do sexy stuff with it. We're trying to say, how do we, again, solve the most mundane problems we all seem to be avoiding while we dream up how it's going to somehow change the dynamic in healthcare where it's not because it's, it's a technology, but we haven't defined the application that is a win-win-win for providers, for patients, for the administrators and the business of healthcare. So unfortunately, I don't see a lot of uh, change coming other than a lot of LinkedIn posts in 2023. Okay. Well, scheduling could make a big difference. And as you said, the specialty one is more complicated. And is, yeah, I mean, the school, that could be a whole, its own podcast. I think I've probably done one uh, on scheduling. I mean, they look at the schedule for something and it's like, it's so far out that what you don't know is like, what are the cancellation rates? Because by the time you get to however far out they're offering, either you don't need it anymore because you're cured or you're dead. Yeah. So chances are, yeah, somebody, they have an opening today because whoever made that appointment, whenever these appointments are available is, is no longer among the living or, uh, you know, they dealt with their problems some other way. So, yeah. Yeah. So where, so, okay. So we'll do LinkedIn posts for next year for, for AI. Uh, where, what are you going to focus on, on an amenities health? Is it basically, you know, starting to scale up some more or what's the, yeah. what's the focus? Yeah, I think one, you're just going to start to hear about us more. So we've been in two years. We're very, very fortunate to work with some early clients who were uh, helping us build out this initial phase. You're going to see start, start to see some of those go lives in Q1 of this year. Um, and we think it'll handedly be the best digital front door, best patient portal in, in, the, in the market when that happens. So you're going to see a lot of us in a lot more places, a lot more referrals, a lot more things like this where we just, I think, get out of not necessarily stealth mode. We weren't trying to keep this a secret. It was just, yeah. we were very busy on the product. Um, and then we will scale the business. So I think we are uh, not just growing in terms of like engineers and product managers and those types of things, but also trying to very much find partners that are excited about new concepts like memberships. So aside from the digital front door, and as we said earlier, getting the suck out of healthcare on those basic friction points, starting to take risks and say, hey, what does a financial membership look like? What does a access uh, membership look like? What does a concierge one look like that's differentiated in the market and or healthy habits one or other things? So I think we're having a lot of those conversations actively, but that's where I'm most excited to say, how do we go beyond just the mechanics of reducing the friction? How do we start to experiment to figure out what's the two day shipping and the, and the uh, free returns for this industry? Great. Well, my last question for you then is about uh, books and wonder, wondering whether you have read any good books lately, anything you would recommend, or since you're being blunt, I'll say anything you would recommend not reading. Well, no, I, uh, I definitely have recommendations. I, I don't think I, I normally don't have the patience to sit through a book if I'm not going to like it, if they haven't yeah. got me the first couple of months, even though I'm a curmudgeon, as you're saying. 
Um, the one that I recommend that I'm, I'm kind of halfway through right now is it's probably not new. I, in fact, I'm sure it's not new. I just don't know when it was the book of the moment. It was called the, the Rational Optimist. I think it's a it's a book about, you know, we have if, if you watch the news, you, you feel like every day we're going to hell in a handbasket. The world's going to end because we're all going to kill each other type of thing. And this just kind of systematically goes through the advantages we have today. And it kind of calms you, if nothing else. But I think even for it's not a healthcare book by any means. But I think it, it helps you understand, like, we have the thing that we've designed. Um, and I, I think people know that inherently, but they complain about or they often say, like, why do we have this healthcare system? Why is it broken? It's the healthcare system that was exactly designed. And what I've thought about with amenities and, and the book, the thing that this book reminds me of is you have to challenge some of those core assumptions. Like, it's not profitable to compete on experience. That's why it's not being done today. Can we change that dynamic to then shift the answer of why do we have the healthcare system that we have? And the rational optimist for me is is just a reminder of that way outside of healthcare, which is where my fun reading always goes. Like I don't I don't like I live healthcare every day. It's so deeply yeah. I don't often like to read. I, I can give you those books, but those are those are less fun. Sounds good. Well, Dr. Awesome Saeed, CEO and founder of Amenities Health, thank you so much for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.